Thank you, sir. First, I would like to record my thanks to Minister and the Commissioner, as well as the Ministry, for moving the amendments. The amendments to the Act are timely. The amendments underscore the importance of upholding the integrity of charities inter alia in management, reporting and fundraising. Sir, integrity is more than an honest intention, more than a good heart. It entails a robust set of procedures to ensure compliance, a discipline within the organisation to comply with the procedures, a conviction ingrained in management, staff and board that we are accountable to our funders, our sponsors, our employees and above all, to our clients and their families. Therefore, I support the bill, particularly in the broadening of the powers of the Commissioner to protect charities and the enhancement of penalties for certain types of non-compliance. Notwithstanding, I seek a few clarifications from the Minister. Whilst I support the amendment to Section 16, I seek clarification as to why subsections 2 and 3 are sought to be amended to apply to quote, a registered charity or an exempt charity, close quote, as opposed to other sections, such as sections 12 and 13, which simply apply to charity. In principle, I support also the proposed amendments to section 25. However, would the minister consider making provision for the extension of the suspension period between 24 months in complex cases? whether exercisable at the discretion of the Commissioner or upon application to court by the Commissioner. A second clarification sought in relation to Section 25 is whether the Government had considered broadening the scope of the section, subsection 12 beyond subsection 2, Roman numerals 4, 5 and 6 to include compliance with other orders of the Commissioner. In relation to Section 25A, in respect of which I note there is no proposal for amendment, can the Minister clarify the basis for the subsection, which provides that it does not apply to an exempt charity? The application of subsection 5 results in an anomaly in which a key officer who has been removed as such from a registered charity may also be removed as a member of the charity, but a key officer who has been removed as such from an exempt charity may remain as a member of the charity. Considering that exempt charities are universities, educational institutions, hospitals, religious bodies, and so on, we would expect that exempt charities be held to equal, if not more, more stringent requirements. In relation to suspension, removal or disqualification orders, would the Minister consider making express provision prohibiting acting by proxy and making it an offence for persons to act by proxies? Finally, in relation to the proposed Section 43, Subsection 7, would the Minister consider providing for service under this subsection to be effected only upon the person's prior written consent? Sir, Having stated my support for the bill, it is my hope that the next review of the Charities Act will be more comprehensive, more visionary, bolder, catalyzing greater vibrancy in the charities sector. For the winds of change are upon us. Our current charities model will not hold. The social economic landscape of Singapore today is beyond what our parents and grandparents envisaged when Singapore became independent. And the future landscape will be beyond what our current charity models can hold. A rapidly growing population, additional touch points, enhanced medical expertise in early intervention, diagnosis and treatment, lifestyle challenges, increased stress points in familial and communal relationships, greater financial uncertainties. There will be an increasing number of people requiring support, more complex needs, more interwoven issues. The demands will be real, in some cases loud. The challenges facing us today are daunting. More clients to be served, more complex needs, more complex issues, more compliance requirements, 
higher public expectations, higher operating costs, limited revenue, limited technology capabilities, limited manpower, limited funds. In four simple words, more needs, less resources. I surmise that our future challenges would in essence be similar but accentuated and possibly with a different complexion. How shall we overcome these challenges? We need to innovate. We need to change our charity mindset. We need to change our charity models before it is too late. Whilst I do not have the solution, I have a few suggestions. First and foremost, we need to professionalize the sector. Although the role of volunteers remains integral to the social service sector, the Singaporean society has developed beyond the early days when charities could be run solely by volunteers. The journey of professionalism, professionalization will be different for every organization, but it must in every case begin and it must never end. Competent, compassionate and committed professionals are key to the welfare of our clients. It is easy to relate this statement immediately to the frontline professionals providing direct services to the clients, such as therapists, social workers, counsellors, teachers, job coaches, medical and allied health workers, and so on. The truth is, behind them are quiet troops working to ensure that the organisation functions efficiently, meets compliance requirements, meets governance standards. Quiet troops cleaning the premises, raising funds, conducting public education, engaging community partners and supporting the frontline professionals, our back-end supporters. They are a critical part of the team, without whom services to our clients will suffer to the ultimate detriment of our clients. It is in the interest of our clients that we attract, retain and develop our professionals and our employees. To do so, we must treat them fairly. And I refer specifically to remuneration. This is an issue recognised also by the government and NCSS. But this is a difficult issue for some members of the public. Those who work in the charity sector, they too have families. They too have aspirations to provide for their families. Please consider the equity in this matter. It is not reasonable or fair to expect those who serve in the charity sector to take a pay cut relative to their peers. To the public, I request that before we next argue that every cent of our donation must go to the beneficiaries, take a look at our own little child and ask if mummy or daddy should take a pay cut for no reason other than that mummy or daddy works in a charity sector. We need good people in the sector and we need to pay them well. Secondly, we need to tap on the readiness, expertise and skill of our volunteers. They are the ones who started our charities. They are still with us today. They bring with them passion, compassion and skills to the organisation that they serve. Let us be innovative and creative in the way we work with our volunteers. They can supplement our manpower without an increase in our EON. They can provide expertise outside that of our organisation's own professionals. They can inspire our professionals. Give volunteers opportunities to contribute meaningfully. Give them a sense of pride as they serve. Thirdly, collaboration within the sector. According to the 2016 annual report of the Commissioner of Charities, there were 2,247 registered charities in 2016, of which only 653 are, are IPCs. In 2015, 46.2% of registered charities had annual receipts of less than $250,000. So almost half of all charities are small charities. Setting up charities, however small, must continue to be encouraged. This is a good reflection of a healthy, spontaneous, spontaneously caring society, one that's willing to give. A small charity is cosy, warm, agile, and more responsive to the needs of its clients. Understandably, however, small charities may have limited resources. Looking at the numbers, I cannot but wonder if 
we could collaborate and what greater impact could be achieved if we collaborated for the benefit of our clients. Collaboration requires us to be vulnerable for we share our strengths with others, but it will strengthen us as a whole. Collaborate we must for our clients and indeed for the sake of our own organisations. Let us work together towards cohesion in the midst of our diversity. Fourthly, adopt low tolerance towards low standards. Our clients deserve no less. They and their loved ones have put their well-being in our hands. They trust us to make a change for them. Our employees deserve no less. There is pride and dignity in their work. We insult them if we expect less of them than do non-charity employers. They deserve challenges, opportunities, support to grow, to flourish, to accomplish, to serve. Lower tolerance for lower service standards. Our funders and sponsors deserve no less. They have shared their resources with us. They have believed in our cause. They are walking the journey with our clients and us. Imposing high standards on ourselves is our way of showing our respect to them. Singapore deserves no less. The community and the government have rallied around those who need support. We, the charities, should be another pillar of support. We must not continue to be a sector dependent on support. This brings me to my fifth point, the sustainability of voluntary welfare organisations. And I wish to emphasise that this point is limited to the context of voluntary welfare organisations. By a conventional approach, we continue to look within ourselves to streamline work processes, better deploy our personnel, increase productivity and hopefully reduce reliance on donations. This conventional approach, while necessary, is not sufficient to see us into the future. Charities are defined as not-for-profit organisations. Must it always be so? The current charity models relies heavily on government funding and donations. A very small proportion of the revenue is derived from very low fees or very low revenue from sheltered enterprises. And most sheltered enterprises are loss-making. The increase in government funding and donations over the years cannot and will not be able to match the growing rate of needs. Think on this. Even the best managed organisations can potentially fall into unsustainable deficit. Can we take that risk? If we fall into an unsustainable deficit, only two things can happen. A bailout because we cannot afford to fail and that would entail funds from the public, more likely through government rescue, or a shutdown resulting in a displacement of clients, a loss of employment, a disruption to the sector. How much of a risk can we stomach? Sir, I submit it is time to change the charities model. Whilst government funding and donations remain desirable, they should no longer be relied upon to form a significant portion of our receipts. I have a vision of a voluntary welfare organisation that is firmly rooted to its vision, committed to serve all clients regardless of status and wealth. But it also engages in revenue generation, with revenue generated being used to execute our mission and our vision. It practices price cross subsidies, not a new concept, but using fees from those who can afford to subsidise fees of those who cannot. The means testing criteria and methodology is updated to align with this fee model. Leveraging on its competencies, it runs additional programmes for profit generation. It goes regional. It exercises prudence in undertaking appropriate risk management assessment, takes actions to hedge against reasonably anticipated risks. All throughout, it remains true to its commitment to serve its clients. This is my vision for a future VWO. If we succeed, we reduce our reliance on public funds. If we fail, we go back to reliance on public funds. But we need the support and the understanding of the, profit, of the public that profits are generated for charitable purposes. We need the support of the government, not 
to remove our ISPC status or compromise our charitable status only on that count. I trust we can work out a feasible model with sufficient safeguards and sufficient latitude for enterprise. Such a model could be seeded by donations or social impact bonds. We can consider social impact bonds. It's new to us, but we can work on that. But it is not a model that must be sustained only by donations. Sir, we must not run this model like a conventional social enterprise. If we do not operate for profits, we are doomed to fail. I am arguing, submitting for the need to build a model that is financially sustainable to take us into the future, a model that requires us to rethink and re-examine the requirement for charities to be not for profit. Sixthly, ownership of our destinies. It is difficult for us to live with little. Compound that difficulty with little or no education, a disability or more, illnesses, failing marriages, single parenthood, difficult children, ailing parents, estranged relations, difficult employment situations, difficult community situations. Is it surprising that many of us spiral downwards physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially? We need help. The government and the charities rightly must step in to help. Intervention must be timely, decisive. The support must be relevant, effective and empowering. Such intervention and support can at best, at best only solve, solve an immediate problem. We must, in the long run, empower and encourage our people to take ownership of their lives so that they can break out of the vicious charity cycle and in turn reach out to support others instead of scurrying for additional resources to support and agree an increasing number of people we build a strong network within this community to support each other more than what money can buy finally speaker sir it is timely to consider renaming ourselves from a relational perspective charity welfare connotes a dispensation of help from one to the other it creates a difference in status and widens the social gap. It accentuates the chasm in mobility, socially, physically, economically, politically. It underscores the vulner vulnerability of the person. It is liable to create a sense of low worth and helplessness in the other party. The term voluntary masks the need for professionalism in service delivery and in the sector. There is indeed growing sentiment on the ground to do away with the VWO label. This conversation brought to fore by NCSS in 2016 should continue. What we call ourselves shape what we think of ourselves, shape our aspirations. A new name, a new future. In conclusion, sir, the winds of change are upon us. It is not enough to trim our sails. It is time to change our vessels. I request the government, our stakeholders and sponsors members of the public to support us. Thank you.